Oh, Yahweh, we need you. Elohim, Adonai, we need you. We need you in every moment. Lord, we do not wake in the morning without you. Everything is by you, with you, through you, for you, Lord. This is your word this morning, Lord. Help us rightfully divide it. Help us to go through it. And, Lord, may it plant a seed in us. And may that seed bear fruit 30, 60, 100 fold as it is watered by you, Lord. The water of life, life eternal with you, Lord, is what we seek. And we know that through you, this is how we become righteous. But Lord, there are many out there who need to hear your word. So we just ask you, as we are rightfully dividing it, this is very clear to us and that we can go out and share the gospel of good news with everyone in this world. Lord, we love you, and it is in the precious name of Yeshua we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. How we doing this morning? Yeah? Right, everybody's all right? Everybody's fine? Well, how about our new guests? How we doing back there? You all right? You all right? All right. That's good. That's good. I like it. So, we are in the book of Ephesians, and we're going to, it's a little shorter today, and everybody's like, oh, good. Now, it's because we have communion after, so don't get excited. It's still going to go till about three this afternoon, so we're, we should be fine. Should be fine. So, listen, we're in chapter two. We finished up with chapter one last week, and we're in chapter two. And chapter two starts off, and, and I'm just going to say that for, for most of the teaching this morning, chapter two is going to be a difficult chapter because chapter two starts really kind of getting after us. It starts to push us a little bit here. And he's calling out Paul, who wrote Ephesians, is calling us out here. So I just want everybody to be aware of the fact that this, this the, the, the first, you know, 90% of this lesson this morning, this teaching this morning, is not easy. It's not, it's not something that uh, we truly do as Christians like to hear, because sometimes we like to hear how much God loves us, and that is true. It, it, it is not that that is not true. But much of God's writing, and I'm a, I'm a believer that much of God's writing is lost on most of our churches today. Because we forget these difficult parts. We forget the parts that challenge us. We forget the parts that make us uncomfortable. We forget the parts that make us grow. This is where we grow. We grow when he puts the pressure on us. He, we grow when he uses the sandpaper to design us. Everybody know what a bonsai tree is? So in Japanese in Japanese, I don't know, you know, you got to ask everybody, you know, there's different levels of what people are interested in. There, and there are some, I see Rob in the back, Rob's probably like, oh, yes, of course I know what a bonsai tree is. But what's amazing about the bonsai tree is that they take this small tree and they manipulate it and they will cut and cultivate this, this tree so that it grows exactly the way they want it to, so that it's shaped exactly the way the hand of the person shaping it has designed it. And doesn't that sound a lot like what God does with us? He shapes us. And sometimes he's got to prune us, and pruning is not something that feels good, right? When he's cutting something out of our lives, that doesn't always feel good. So I just want everybody to be aware that one of the things that I think goes on culturally, especially in the Western churches, I think we love to hear the love message, but we then conflate judgment with truth. You see, that's not the same. Truth is not judgment. If you're running for a cliff and I say, hey, <laughs> stop, you're going to go off this cliff. It's, it, you're not going to like what happens. It's going to, it's going to be a challenge. There's going to be a problem. That cliff Come on in, Troy. Morning. Good to see you, brother. How you doing? And we do, if you'd like, this for children, 
depending on what you'd like, your comfort level. There are there's some people downstairs that also can take care of the child, but they're welcome here in the sanctuary. So you do whatever you'd like. <laughs> Little one sleeping. I love it. Good, good job. So as I was saying, that pruning, that manipulating of us, removing of some of those branches that we don't need so that he shapes us in his image. I call it sandpaper. And I'll tell you what, when I talk about the Lord and me, I, he, let me tell you something. He must own stock in Home Depot because he used so much sandpaper on my life, it's not even funny. And heavy grit, right? He didn't even, it wasn't even like he used fine grit with me. There's heavy grit in my life. Why? Because he had to form me, mold me, shape me to what he called me to be. Yeah, and like a chisel and sledgehammer. Sometimes that works too. <laughs> but what I see in the beginning, the first few verses here in Ephesians is going to speak to that. But ours is never to be offended by the word of God in the respect that it turns us off. Ours is to be quickened to the offense, meaning, ooh, that hurt. Let me start working on that area of my life. Does that make sense, everyone? Yeah. All right. So, ready? We're going to read. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down today piece by piece so that we can get to some of this. First part of this, and you were dead in your offenses and sin, right? So we see it up here. And you were dead in your offenses and sin. Listen. Apart from Christ, we're dead. There is no eternal life. There is spiritual separation. It is a powerful, powerful verse. Because it speaks to even those of us who know Jesus now. We were dead in our sins. No sin allows us to go literally before the Lord eternally. So... I don't care what your sin is, and that's another thing that we, in the Western churches, we, we tend to point the fingers at certain sins and say, oh, those are horrible. Those are rotten. The truth of the matter is, all, we all fall short of God's glory. We all fall short, short of God's glory. The verse says, none is good. No, not one. So, we must be careful when bringing the news to people, the good news. We have to speak truth, but let's not be holier than that. It is a humble and loving bringing proclamation of the word. And I'll tell you what, frequently, if you can tell your story to somebody about how God saved you and how wretched you were, guess what? It sets a tone saying, hey, I'm not judging you per se. I'm telling you the truth, and I'm telling you how it impacted my life, right? Yeah. So let me give you Romans 6, 23 out of the NASB. It says this, for the wages of sin are death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So yes, we're dead in our offense until we know Jesus, right? So we're all dead in it, but it is a gracious gift of mercy and love that God gave us Christ to wash our iniquity, our sins away when we believe in him and call upon him. Yes? Amen. Everybody there with that? Amen. Okay. So, next piece. In which you previously walked according to the course of this world. Wow. Wow. So, here's the word of God calling us all out. Even those of us who now believe in Jesus. He's calling us out. He's saying, hey guys, let's not forget you walked there. That's where you were. Right? You were in this world. You were of the world. You were doing the things that they are doing too. So do not get uppity. Yes, are you to teach yeah, that's what he says, right? What is the scripture good for? Teaching, correcting, and rebuking. 
right? So, yes, we're to teach, but let's, while we're teaching, remember that the rock, until we turned our lives over to Christ, the rock would have fallen upon us and crushed us too. We would have been crushed by our own iniquity. Yes? Yep. Amen? Amen? All right. So, let me have, I got uh, Romans, please. No, not Romans, excuse me. Colossians 2, 13 in the Amplified, please. Thank you. All right, so I'll read it to you in the Amplified. Here's what it says. When you were dead in your sins and in the circum... Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. Circumcision of your flesh, uncircumcision of your flesh, the worldliness, the manner of life in which you live. God made you alive together with Christ, having freely forgiven us all of our sins. So here it is. He's telling us that we are dead to our sin. We're dead to our sin. And we walked in a manner of worldliness, in the manner of the flesh. We were uncircumcised in the flesh, but also, and why is he saying uncircumcised in the flesh here? Does everybody know? Because he's speaking to two people. He's speaking to the Jewish converts, and he's speaking to the Gentile converts. Jewish converts already were circumcised in the flesh. The Gentiles were not. We were in a worldly manner, right? We went after the things of this world. We had no idea who Yahweh was. None. So, yes, he's saying you were uncircumcised not only in your flesh, but in your heart. See, the new covenant speaks to a circumcision of the heart. Yes? Okay. So, God made you alive together with Christ, having freely forgiven us all of our sins. So guess what? Through Christ, your sins have been forgiven. It's a beautiful thing. Because he's telling us that there is no human being on the face of the earth that has walked outside of darkness, outside of the worldliness. We all have fallen short of God's glory. And it is only through the gracious, merciful gift of God that we are alive together with him through Christ. Amen? That's powerful, guys. It's powerful. Because that means all of us in the church here in the sanctuary and the folks downstairs watching over the children, that means we all fell short of God's glory. There was not a moment in our lives before Jesus that we were righteous. Not one. Not one second. We have to remember that. You know, it's fascinating, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little sidebar here. It's fascinating that you can go down to New Haven, as we did yesterday, just one town in the world, and minister and feed people. And when we're there, one of the things that it is incumbent upon us not to be is judgmental. There is no judgment because that's what will put us in judgment. When we start judging others with a critical eye, there are people in need, like we were in need. Some have a different need than others, but we all had needs and only Jesus satisfies those needs. It's only through God that we are righteous. It's only through God that we get up in the morning. It's only through God that we get to go down there and do that. So please, when dealing with one another, brothers and sisters in Christ, we're supposed to have love for each other. Everybody that's in the sanctuary right now is a brother and sister in Christ if you're a believer in Jesus. We're supposed to love each other, but when we go out through those doors, are we to be strong? Without question. We're supposed to be strong because we have to endure to the end. That denotes stamina and strength. But he always says it's truth in love. Truth in love. How does the love of God exist in you if you have the ability to help a brother or sister and you do not do it? We have to be loving, gracious, kind. And yes, sometimes the message is, it's hard. 
Listen, how many of us want to hear, hey, hey, John, I'll use myself as an example. Ready? Hey, buddy, here's what we got for you. You know when you're driving your truck and somebody's going four miles an hour in a 40 and you get completely frustrated and you start losing your mind and you are completely like just out of it? You know when you're doing that, John? You're a lost soul. You're no good. You're dirty. You're filthy. You're awful. You know what John's going to do? Hey, 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 hey. Go easy now. Go easy now. My story? In other words, I'm not going back. That way, then I'm going to submit. But if somebody in the flesh is telling me those things, I can, I can feel myself sometimes get a little bit of, uh, okay. Right. What, I, what am I saying? It's always better to know somebody. It's always better to work in God's truth when you know them and you love them. And if, you know, if you're out in the street and you don't know anybody, guess what? Show them some love. Show them some kindness. And yes, you can be truthful. You can bring the true word of God to somebody. There's no question about it. But I want to make sure that we're erring on the side of love. Because if you have all these things, what do you say? You can prophesy, you can do all kinds of things, but if you don't have love, what do you have? You're a sounding gong. Okay? So when we go to make disciples of all nations, when we're out there talking, love's got to be the first thing we lead with. Make sense, everyone? Please, just so you know. All right. Next line. According to the prince of the power of the air. According to the prince of the power of the air. That's the next line in the... So, who's the prince of the power of the air, everybody? The devil, Satan, right? What else is he called in the scripture? What's, what else is Satan called in the scripture? Beelzebub, Lucifer deceiver, father of lies. adversary, father of lies, the accuser of the brethren, <laughs> the accuser of the brethren. Yes, all of those things. And God of this world. God of this world. That's a powerful position. Small g. Very small. <laughs> but why do I say that? Why do I also remind you, and he, it is true, he's called all those things, but why do I also remind you that he is God of this world? Because what is the verse talking about? It's talking about walking in this world and succumbing to this world and being in the world and of the world. And that's not what we're called to be as believers in Christ. In it, but not of it. What's that mean, guys? What's it mean, in it, not of it? The things of this world, right? The things of this world. We're not supposed... <laughs> I love it. The things of this world. We're not supposed to be chasing after them. We are supposed to keep our eyes on heavenly things. We're supposed to be moving in a heavenly direction. We're supposed to be moving for God. Not away from him and towards the world, but away from the world and towards him. Make sense? So, if that's Satan, can I have 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 out of the NASB? Please. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel, of the glory, of Christ, who is the image of God. Amen. So what is he saying here? What is Paul saying? We walked in accordance with the world. We were blinded by the God of this world to desire the things of this world and not to live out what God has called us to do, what God has asked us to do, which is live out his truth, not our own. Our own truth, and you hear that all the time now, right? I know my truth. 
No. We shouldn't know anything about our truth. We should know everything about his truth. His truth. We don't have a truth apart from Christ. We don't have one apart from him. We've got lies. The heart is desperately wicked. Right? Isn't that what it says? So apart from Christ, we don't have a truth. And that's the beauty of this, these lessons. Because we think that we can go and truly understand what the Lord is saying and then put one foot in the world and then the other foot in the kingdom. We can't do it. We can't do that. There's one truth. And it has nothing to do with the world. It has nothing to do with our fleshly desires. It has everything to do with the kingdom. It has everything to do with the word of God. It has everything to do with what God has set us up for. And that is to live out eternity in his righteousness, but becoming holier and righteous through Christ and walking that out daily. We got to work out our salvation. That is a daily journey. It's a daily exercise. It's really an exercise second to second. We can be doing this and everybody's absorbing. Two minutes after we're done, we could be out there screaming at somebody. It is literally a second to second working out, a walk. And it's incumbent upon us to understand that. We have to be in it constantly. If we're not in it, we are constantly moving in one direction or the other, guys. If you're standing still, you're moving in the wrong direction. I hate to say that. You know, we hear people say all the time, oh, I'm not voting, as an example. I'm not going to vote. Well, if you don't vote, guess what happens? It's a vote for the other guy. So if you're just neutral, you're voting for the other guy. Jesus said, I would rather have you hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. Be passionate. Be on fire. Be a burning amber for the Lord. The next portion of the verse. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Wow. While we start tightening up that we were walking in the world, we're walking all over in accordance with Satan. We are working through the flesh in accordance with the enemy, right? And then he says, through the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. What's the spirit? No, who? The Antichrist. Spirit of the Antichrist, right? Spirit of the Antichrist. Why? Because he is now working in us to be sons and daughters of disobedience. See that? Do we understand what that means? So here's the spirit of the Antichrist. And let me read to you John, 1 John, please, 4, 2, and 3. And then we'll break that down a little bit because I want to make sure everybody's clear on it. 1 John, chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. By this you know and recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges and confesses the fact that Jesus Christ has actually come in the flesh as a man is from God. God is its source. Meaning God is the Spirit that gave you that. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus, acknowledging that he has come in the flesh, but would deny any of the Son's true nature. True nature of what? God, his godly nature, godly characteristics, right? That's what we would be denying. Is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is now already in the world. This is John writing this. Now this is John the Apostle. This writing is attributed to John the Apostle. The 
most beloved disciple, as he calls himself. That's, yeah, so he says, right? I love that. I love the fact that John's like, no, yeah, no, the apostle that Jesus loved laid his hand on it. And then the apostle that Jesus loved beat Peter to the tomb. Little spirit of competition between John and Peter, right? That guy's a punk. Guy's a punk. I don't know what he's doing, but he is weak. Listen, the beauty of what John is saying and the beauty of what John knows is that God loves him. God loves him. And that he really is loved. And so what he's saying here is we need to understand that Jesus Christ is King of kings, Lord of lords, and that every attribute of Christ is God. That we are looking at God in the flesh. And that we must confess and believe that Christ is Messiah, Lord, Savior, God. Make sense? And if we don't confess that, we have the spirit of the Antichrist. We're working against Jesus here. When we, this is exactly what he's saying. This is what Paul writes in his letter. Okay? But what are we saying when we are sons and daughters of disobedience? If we don't know Jesus, we're working against him. So let me give you this. Let me lay this out for you. Every philanthropic agency in our government that does not call out the name of the Lord, that does not bow its knee to Jesus, is the spirit of the Antichrist. Amen. Why do I say it? Because we're out there doing good things, right? They're handing people money. They're trying to make sure that people are comfortable. That's good. That's not bad. That's good. But it's still against Christ because they don't recognize him as Lord and Savior. Does that make sense? We've got to give glory to where glory belongs. Amen. Let me give you this. And I know most people don't look at it this way, but I'm going to give you a little insight that I got. We thought about it a little while ago. Do we all know the woman who had the issue of the blood? Do we know that the scripture says, one of the writings says that she was hiding after she touched yeah. Christ? Yeah. Do we know why Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? And he said he felt the power leave him. Who touched me? And what did the disciples say? Are you kidding me? There's 50,000 people in the city right now, and they're all rubbing up against you. Who touched you? He said, no, 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 no. Somebody touched me with a purpose. Somebody touched me with a purpose. Why do we think that Jesus purposely went back and said, who touched me with the purpose? Because he didn't, she did not glorify God. She didn't acknowledge it. So who would have gotten the glory? Nobody. It's important to understand this. To the glory be God. It is his, it always was, and always will be. Jesus purposely turned and said, who did it? Then it said, scripture says, he saw her. And he said, your faith has made you whole. Why? So he could glorify God. He could glorify the power of the Spirit living within him. If he had not done that, she is healed and nobody knows who did it. We're not to steal God's glory. We are not to steal God's glory. Everything we do must glorify the Lord. Everything we are must glorify the Lord. Every time we speak and people hear it, and you, if you're out in the field and you're working in the field and people come to the Lord because you're willing to bring the gospel to them, you must glorify the Lord. It's not us doing it. It's the Lord doing it. We're just vessels. Whoever built this beautiful cathedral back in 1846, nobody would say the sledgehammers built it. Nobody would say that. They'd say the stone cutters built it. The masons built it. Does that make sense? We're just tools. He is the stone cutter. We're just the tools. 
everything must glorify the Lord. And I want you to watch this now. I want you to watch this. Can I have the next verse, please, starting at 3? Yep, Ephesians 3, please. Thank you. Among them, we too all previously lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Just as the rest. Who are the children of wrath? Unbelievers. Who else? Well, we have, there's a particular variety of unbelievers, right? There's the true unbeliever who was the atheist or the agnostic, if you will, right? That's an unbeliever. But how about unrepentant believers? How about those, how about those folks? Unrepentant believers. We have a church in the West filled with unrepentant believers. My friend who walked in a little earlier, I'm going to use you if you don't mind. I didn't know you would be here, but I'm glad you are. But I'm going to use you, Troy, if you don't mind. Troy is a believer. And we were at the train station on Wednesday. And I saw Troy outside of the, the, outside of the two doors. Jehovah's Witnesses were posted. And they had a rack of their watchtower pamphlets. And I saw Troy, he had one in his hand, and he was speaking to them. Now, we were going in and out, bringing food, ministering to folks, right? But I saw that Troy had one in his hand. And so the Spirit of the Lord told me, go to Troy. Go talk to him. Now, I looked for him, and now he was inside all the way down at the other end. So we went down and spoke. And boy, oh boy, did the Spirit of the Lord pull us together quickly. But here's what I mean by unrepentant believers. The Jehovah's Witness person. We were talking about, Troy likes to talk to them about their beliefs. The Jehovah's Witness person who Troy had established a relationship with through talking to him. Walked by the three of us. Joyce was with me at the time. He walked by the three of us, and Troy said something very nice. He just said, right, brother, or something along that lines. And he said, you know, we, we talk. And the guy said to him, get away from me. I'm tired of you. This is, this is, and he said it with this vitriol, this hate. Unrepentant. Believers, They don't really believe Christ is who he is, first and foremost. But secondly, look at the Spirit. You will know me by your love for each other. He did not exhibit any, Would you agree with that? No love exhibited there. Why do I say that? Because we are filled with unbelieving believers. We love to take pieces of the Scripture. Oh, this fits. But the one that says, love your enemies and pray for them. I don't have to do that. I'm just going to circle myself with all the same people who believe all the same things. How do you think denominations started? Amen. So, having said that, we all sinners apart from Jesus, by the way, are children of wrath. If you don't believe in Jesus, who he is, I don't care if it's Jehovah's Witness. I don't care if it's a Mormon. And, and, and what does the scripture say about calling out false teaching? You're supposed to call it out, guys. When, it's, when you're confronted with it, you got to call it out. You just can't let it sit. Because they're teaching others. We have accountability. But... The reason I say that is because all who are not in Jesus, all sinners apart from Christ, are children of wrath. We were. Think back to your life. When did you take Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Because up until that point, 
guess what you were? And I'll raise my hand first. I'm probably, actually, I don't know if all of you know this or not. You may not know the verse, but it says, do not aspire to be a teacher. You know that? It says, don't aspire to be a teacher. You know why? Because I'm going to hold you even more accountable. You see, I come up here and I really want to rightfully divide it because I don't want to sit before him on Judgment Day and have him go, what were you thinking? Because I know he said you will be more accountable. So here I am at a young age knowing what I was supposed to do, and here's my point. Knowing what I was supposed to do and not doing it. Do you think for one minute that while I was in that position, if I had died, that he would have welcomed me? I wasn't doing any of the things he asked me to do. So you guys are not alone. I am the chief sinner. But by his grace, I'm here. By his love, I'm here. And he is the one that stayed faithful and true. Not me. Not me. I did not. And I know this, that I know there was a heavy price on me for not doing what I was called to do. I know there's going to be a day when I'm going to stand before him and he's going to say, look at all these people you were supposed to help, but you didn't heed the call. You let them all go. You let every one of them go because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. You abandoned your position. I know he's forgiven me, but I know I'm going to have to answer to it. I know he's forgiven me. And he's accelerated me. And I thank him for it. I praise him for it. But I didn't do all the things I was supposed to do. But he's got me there now. We have to fully abide in Christ. If we're not fully abiding in Christ, if we're not really teaching Christ's word, and we're not living as Christ called us to live, we're working against him. We can't be apart from Christ. We have to be within him. We have to submit to him. May I have James 4 and 4 in the Amplified, please? We're almost done. Got it? Okay. You adulteresses, you disloyal sinners, flirting with the world and breaking your vow to God. Isn't that what I just told, my, told you guys? That's what, how I behave? Do you know, or not know, excuse me, that being the world's friend, that is loving the things of this world as being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Guys, the reason why I tell you my story is because I know I was an enemy of God. I'm not going to mince words. I'm not going to parse. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to fluff it. It's just not who I am. I'm okay saying, all right, Lord, I know what I had to do. I know what I didn't do, but I know where I am now. It's fully laid down, and it's all out. And I pray that you'll accelerate all of those who I should have brought home now. But we cannot, we, we, we can't, we can't, we can't be afraid to speak truth. We can't be afraid to speak truth to ourselves, starting with ourselves. We have to be truthful. It's okay to say, ooh, I messed that up bad. Lord, I'm sorry. That's what he wants. That's how we correct. That's how he guides us. This journey is never stopping from being corrected. I don't care how deep, how long. Esther's not here today. I don't care if you've been with the Lord 50 years. We talked about this at Bible study. 
50 years her father was a pastor. 50 years has known the Lord deeply. And she's a lovely person, a God-fearing person. And she says, every day, every day I make mistakes. It's a constant journey of corrections. We must start with ourselves so that we can help others. So if I may, we've heard about this world a little bit. So what are the things of this world? Can I have 1 John 2, 15 and 16, please? Thank you. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. I'm going to read it again in the Amplified. Do not love the world of sin that opposes God and his precepts, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust and the sensual craving of the flesh and the lust and the longing of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, the pretentious confidence in one's resources or in the stability of earthly things. These things did not come from the Father, but are of the world. Wow. Does that cover it? That's 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Does that cover it? All right, now, ready? I don't want a show of hands. I do not want a show of hands, but I want a show of spirit. How many of us hear this verse in the Amplified, because they lay it out a little more, how many of us hear this verse and we think, oh, yeah, no, I don't do any of that. No, nope, I do none of that. No, nope, I'm good. I could check that off on my heavenly you know, checklist. Big check. All of us, we're all good, right? None of us do that. None of us think, man, that guy made me angry. None of us think, wow, you know what? I'm going to do this. None of us think of that. None of us think, oh, this one's going to sting a little bit. I could go to church next week. Ah, nah, I'm not going to invite anybody to hear the true word of God being preached at a small church in Norfolk. I'm tired today. I'm, I'm a little under it. You know what? It's a beautiful fall day, and there's a lot of fairs going on. I got to get me some corn dogs. Turkey legs, cider donuts, cider donuts, cider donuts would tempt me. I don't know. I don't. You know. I'm sorry. Cider donuts put it on me a little bit. But do we know what I'm saying here? It's so much easier to just hear that little voice of dissension. You don't have to make it up next week. You know why he doesn't want you here every week? so that you miss a powerful message that impacts your life. It was meant for you. It was meant to help you grow. It was meant to help you get closer to him. And what happened? Your flesh lied to you. Your flesh lied to you. Does everybody know, and this is not to pat myself on the back, does everybody know the hours that I put in to try to bring messages to everybody? You know why? Because the Lord loves you. The Lord loves you. Yes, I know my messages can be a little eesh. Because I got to bring you the truth. I love you. All of you. And I've got to be truthful about all of this. We could pretend. I will say this. If you, if you have the ability, I know Bones has asked me, can you please sit down with me and just show me what you do and how you do what you do? But if you had the ability to come where I am and watch what I watch and read what I read and see what I see, you would see that most of my list is people, pastors, preachers, that don't, they don't mince words. They put it on you. And I love it. My spirit quickens to it. I want to know that I'm doing wrong. 
I want to know that I'm failing so that I can then change it. I want to know these things. Don't tell me God loves me. I know he loves me. He died for me. There's a cross that shows me that. What do I need to do to be better for him? His love is already perfect. How do I become perfect for him? In him, by him, through him, with him. But I have, I, I, did you ever hear you got to put a little flesh in the game? Got to have a little skin in the game? That's what this is all about. Skin in the game. So, moving from that perspective, we know, and I, know, I told you this was going to be a, a, not an easy lesson this morning because the first few verses of, of what Paul was writing here in Ephesians, I just want to make sure we understand that everyone in the world is either apart from Christ or in Christ, right? Right? Those who are apart from Christ, we are to call lovingly and gently home. We are to bring the gospel to them. Those who are in Christ but not doing the right things, there's a little more of a stiff rebuke there. When you're in Christ and you're not doing the right things, look who Jesus always went after. He went after the religious who didn't know where the heck they were. So for those of you that sit in the sanctuary, I'm always going to kick you in the fanny more than when we go out and I'm ministering to people in the streets who don't know the Lord. I've got to get you straight. This is the flock. If you guys want to run in a million different directions, that's on me. I know you don't know that. Many of you don't. But it's on me as the shepherd. He's the good shepherd that I follow, but guess what he said to me? Hey. There's a flock over there in Norford. I need you to tend to that. And by the way, if those sheep want to start running all over the place, you better get them corralled because we got one way to go. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. So that's why it's a little more of a difficult journey here with this pastor than maybe at other places. But it's not done out of anger. It's not done out of hatred. It's done out of love. And it's done because it is proper. It is the right thing to do. Gather you all. Make sure we push in the right direction. Anybody ever see a little sheepdog working? Woo! He works hard. Not only that, but what is he? Listen. He nips at their heels, and he runs around the flock constantly. What's the other thing he does? He barks. He's got a job to do. Now, do you think some of the sheep enjoy the fact that he's nipping at their heels and barking at them? But are they going to enjoy being eaten by the wolf more? Got it? Yes, I know it can be difficult. But trust me, the other side is way more difficult. So, having said that, let me give you the last thing that I have here. Because I want to I leave this on a very light note. Verse 4 starts this way. But God. But God. Thank you, Jesus. Being rich in mercy. Oh, my goodness. But God. Being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. But God. But God. He's so different than we are. And I'll give you John 3.16, please, in the Berean. Everyone who's been around for a little bit knows my favorite verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen? So no matter the fact that we were dead to our sins, no matter the fact that others are dead to their sins, when we receive the gift of mercy and love through 
His Son, the only Son, we are saved. And you know the beauty of this? I was watching, I think I mentioned it to John. I was watching the other night, we were watching His Only Son. Anybody see that movie? About Abraham? His Only Son. God did not ask Abraham to do something he wouldn't do himself. And yet he was merciful and gracious and loving and took Isaac off the altar. But he didn't take his own son off the altar. He is a merciful, gracious, and loving God. Can I have Romans 5 and 8, please? But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, it is the most powerful understanding that your brokenness, your weaknesses, mine too, but all of it collectively, he went to that cross knowing that the only way he could save us, broken, weak, sinful, is to die for us. And he wouldn't be deterred. And the beauty of this is this. It's a free gift. All you have to do is receive it. All you have to do is take it. Take the free gift. It is a wonderful, powerful, eternal, salvation, life-saving, powerful giving, all-in-all-encompassing, life-changing, miraculously free, gracious gift of love and mercy. All right, everyone. We're going to have communion. So, I will go through the process. We have two stations. We're changing this. So we're going to do two stations. One on one. You can, you can, we can go to our positions. That's it. So, we're going to have the body and blood on one side, the body and blood on the other. So wherever you're seated, come up, grab the elements, please. Pray over them. Go back to your seats and then pray some more and partake in this. And it will take as long as it takes. We want you to go back and have some time with the Lord. We don't want you to take your elements here per se as in, eat them, swallow them, etc. Just take them and go back to your seat and have some prayer and have some time with Jesus. Have some time with the Lord to thank him in all things. So, I'll give you the background. Most of you already know it. It was during Passover that Jesus led his disciples to the upstairs room to celebrate the Passover. And during supper, Jesus took bread and he looked up to heaven and he gave God thanks. He gave Yahweh thanks. And he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. And he said this, take this. This bread is my body, which I will be giving up for you. When supper had ended, again, our Lord took his cup and he looked up to heaven and he gave thanks again. And then as he did, he said, take this all of you and drink from it. He said, this is my blood, which should be shed for you and the sins of all mankind. It is the new 
an everlasting covenant. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So, he asked us to do this in memory of him. This is a reverent and incredibly important part of our faith because we then honor him and glorify him in doing so. So please, 